Thank you all so much for joining At Risk to Rescue, how to keep your clinical trials on track. My name is Chris Vogel. I'm the executive director of ECOA Solutions here at Clario and also the moderator for today's event. We're really excited to get together and talk to you all about a topic that's not always the easiest to discuss, right? Rescue situations can be challenging for all the parties involved, and that can be for CROs and sponsors, obviously the technology provider who's being brought in potentially to kind of get things back on track. So we want to zoom out and really focus on a couple key things for today. First, we're going to make sure that we just set a baseline, right? Let's all get on the same page of what is a rescue study. Um, and from there, we'll kind of go down two different paths. First, we'll consider how do we avoid them all together, right? So we understand that there's stressful situations that can um, certainly put clinical trials at risk. So what are some things at a CRO and sponsor and technology provider level that we can think about that will help us avoid the situation where a rescue might be needed? And then we'll also kind of think through if a situation presents itself, it's necessary to make that move. What happens from a CRO, sponsor, and technology provider level should it be necessary to come in and, and change providers and make sure that things kind of get back on track from a rescue study perspective. Luckily, I have two resident experts here to help guide us through the discussion. I'm happy to have them introduce themselves and, and tell us a little bit about their current roles. Um, so let's start off first by joining um, or joining us from Parkcell as Associate Director Global Clinical Procurement, Erica Bukel. Erica. Hi, thanks, Chris. Uh, and thanks to Clario for inviting me to sit on this panel. Uh, part of my remit in procurement is to uh, evaluate technology vendors uh, on a study by study basis uh, it, to enable that we are making the best choice and picking the best partner for that particular trial. So I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thanks so much, Erica. Uh, and second, joining us from Clario is Vice President of Global Project Management, Shadi Zogi. Shadi? Hi, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's great to be here today. I'm excited to discuss rescue studies and how to avoid them. Um, I've been with Clario for about four years now and I'm responsible for the Global Project Management team. So it's great to be here. Thanks, Chris. Perfect. Well, I, I certainly feel uh, in very good hands with uh, the two experts here. I know that we all have been involved from a rescue study perspective, both at the CRO and obviously the technology provider perspective. So why don't we start there? Um, and maybe for you, Shadi, let's just, let's all get on the same page and make sure that we're all um, thinking the same thing. So what is a rescue study? What does this mean? Yeah, so a rescue study is a clinical trial where um, the endpoint solution has to be replaced. Uh, frankly, it's due to the quality of the implementation. There could be regulatory concerns, um, accuracy of data that's been collected, or just overall mismanagement of the study that requires a change in the provider. Um, this results in a difficult situation for the sponsors the study teams, the sites, and then ultimately the patients that have been involved with the study um, so far. And I think you kind of hit on some key points there about the various stakeholders that, that impacts, right? So it's not just necessarily the technology, but it could impact sponsor, zero, site, all the mm -hmm. patients. So there's so many uh, individuals that that could impact. Are there any unique attributes or challenges specific to rescue studies that you can think of? Yes, um, so these uh, rescue studies, typically, you know, the challenges that we see are timeline pressures to meet enrollment goals, uh, data quality and data integrity issues. Um, if a study is already live, ch those challenges are related to transitioning the patients and the sites to these new solutions, uh, retraining sites and ensuring site and patient engagement. Um, and then ultimately, this leads to lots of frustrations for the study team sites and patients that are involved. So again, it's, it's really related to all the challenges that we talked about and the reasons why these studies go off track. And, and, and when, I think is a key point too, when I was listening to you talk, and maybe this is for you, Erica, from, from the CRO perspective, is there a particular time in the trial process when this typically happens, uh, when you know it's, it's necessary to have this rescue occur? Or is it does it happen typically in one place, or could it be at any point? Uh, you know, a sponsor can, or a CRO can decide any time to rescue a study. Uh, typically, the issues do not arise until after the first patient in, uh, that when it becomes apparent that the data quality and integrity are at risk. Uh, but I have seen it happen prior to uh, FPI, but it is typically after the first patient's in. 
in, in, in parlaying on that, in those situations, what were some of the leading challenges that were, you know, necessitated this, this technology change? I think uh, Shadi touched on some of it uh, previously, but missed deadlines, uh, your, you know, poor data quality or data integrity, um, you know, missing data, uh, software failures, um, poor project plan implementation, uh, or poor site support. So can be a, a tricky one. So it sounds like it could be, you know, not only just the technology itself, but also just a gap in communication or a gap in um, you know, being transparent from a timeline perspective, potential quality challenges. So there's a variety of impacts, I guess, that can, can kind of allow technology providers to end up in this, in this situation. Absolutely. Okay. So from establishing the baseline, I think, I think we've got it now, right? So I think we can agree rescue study means that Technology provider is selected for a variety of reasons. Things go off track, whether it be quality, you know, technical, regulatory, timelines, communication. Um, there, there comes a point in the trial where we may potentially need to change technology providers. So I think we're all we're all agreed on that on that baseline. And I think for all intents and purposes, we all agree that we don't ever really want to end up in that in that situation, regardless of the stakeholder that that it is. So let's go down the, the first track and think. Okay, so. How do we avoid this altogether, right? How do we not end up in a situation where, um, from a technology provider perspective, a switch needs to be made? Um, so, and maybe, Erica, we start with you. So, how can sponsors and zeros avoid the likelihood of, of a rescue situation? I think proper qualification of the vendor and validation of their technology, making sure that it is uh, that the that the company that you're working with is sound, that their capabilities are, you know, a accurate and, and and that you have a strong vendor partner relationship. And uh, just like our Clario and Parkcell relationship, uh, and then properly evaluating each study for the best technology fit. So are there certain, on that, on that same front, are there certain red flags then at the zero level that you look for that, okay, when I'm qualifying a technology provider, if I'm thinking about using this, uh, are there certain red flags or things you look for as you evaluate that? Absolutely. The vendor, you know, the, the things that you look for are vendors' lack of experience in a particular therapeutic area, their track record of performance, uh, the uh, collaborating on the project plan by the project management team, and then if missed deadlines or timelines during the startup, that's also a red flag. Right. So that kind of poor communication sets a tone um, you know, for kind of how things are going. On that same thread, are there any like, like key technical attributes that are important when assessing a technology partner specific to um, you know, the things that are being used for that you know, individual trial? Yes, uh, you want to look at the system capabilities, including the system's flexibility and their ability to handle any kind of technical changes as they arise, because we all know that you know, that happens. And then you want to be able to have that good visibility into that vendor's processes. And also having that vendor have a 24 hours, 27 days a week support system for our sites. That's a big factor as well. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I, I, I agree, Erica, from a flexibility standpoint, as we all know, um, there's never been a trial that goes start to finish without some type of change. So that, that ability to pivot and, and really be able to handle those are, are certainly important. Um, we, we talked a lot about uh, collaboration and communication. So, Shadi, maybe to you, um, what are some of the key behaviors that a technology partner should demonstrate during setup to help ensure that you're you know, having a successful launch and that you don't necessarily find yourself in a position where a rescue might be needed? So, as Erica mentioned before, it's critical uh, to choose a partner that has experts around the globe to support all phases of a study. Um, a partner that clearly defines roles and responsibilities and timelines up front uh, is proactive in their communication, risk management, and overall responsiveness. A partner that brings deep scientific and regulatory expertise to overcome compliance challenges with 24 by seven support services to proactively uh, support sites and patients has a global footprint to support many countries and thousands of patients from a logistics, supply chain, and translations perspective. Um, the right partner should be able to ramp up quickly, 
understand current challenges and pain points, and ultimately should be highly focused on delivery excellence. Let's pick that apart a bit. I feel like you just had the playbook for, you know, how to, how to make sure we avoid this nailed down right there. And there are some kind of key aspects of that. So scientific support and making sure that the, the solutions that are offering are technically sound from a regulatory perspective, global footprint, support, uh, ability to be clear on timelines, all that leads towards allocating resources, right? So from your perspective, Shadi, then what characteristics um, do technology providers consider when allocating resources for a new study start? Because I think a lot of that parlays back into what you were saying there. Yeah, it really comes down to allocating an experienced team that has a successful track record of rescuing studies. Um, they can leverage lessons learned, best practices. They understand the, the sponsor, the site, the patient situation. Um, and, you know, along with that, I think it's also important to have experience and expertise in the therapeutic area, the specific indication, and also the instruments that are being used. I mean, that's critical. So overall, it's their previous experience and successful track record that's going to enable us to quickly ramp up uh, on a successful uh, rescue transition. Perfect. Those are all, all definitely attributes from, from a resource perspective that I think kind of ensure a smooth, smooth takeoff. So, so thanks for, for uh, that insight. Um, so from there, then, I think we kind of checked off baseline, right? We're all agreed with what the rescue is. We had a lot of good insight and ideas on how to avoid it. But I think we all know, have been involved with, have heard about situations where this just happens, right? You get to a point in the trial, a, situ a, a sponsor or a CRO has to make that call, that often difficult call of, am I going to make this move, right? Am I going to change things? Is it going to impact the overall, you know, uh, timelines of my trial, data quality, many, many things. So let's shift into considering, okay, we're at the point now, I think we've made that decision and, and we're going to move technology partners. Um, so Shadi, maybe if we start with you, I think it's fair to say, and we all probably agree that rescue studies are often associated with um, problems around data quality and integrity. Um, so what are some of the risks associated with these problems? And then how do you inspire confidence in a relaunch as the new technology provider coming in? Definitely. Um, the risks are associated with um, the implementation of low quality data strategy, um, which typically result in unreliable trial data, um, site non-compliance or reporting issues. Ultimately, we see regulatory impact, low compliance, and um, trial failure as a result. So the way we can uh, inspire confidence is by bringing in the right scientific development, uh, training, and data management expertise to improve the overall solution architecture, the data strategy, and then also the training um, to successfully relaunch and um, improve compliance and ensure site and patient engagement throughout the remaining parts of the study. So perfect segue to, to where I was going and thinking, you talked about engagement. So as a new technology provider coming in to potentially rescue, what, what level of engagement is expected? Like how, how is that uh, initial interaction and, and subsequent weeks handled? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it starts with forming an experienced team that has uh, implemented rescue studies in the past and has a proven rescue methodology to rapidly engage and manage each study. So I really can't stress um, that enough. It's, it's truly a differentiator um, for uh, successfully implementing uh, a rescue. Uh, this team should quickly align with the sponsor and complete a current state um, assessment they should review uh, the current st uh, status of the study, existing design, look at study challenges with the current provider. Uh, they should review translations, licensing, reporting requirements, data management design consideration, uh, instrument continuity uh, to reduce the burden on sites and patients, uh, release timelines, enrollment plans, et cetera. Uh, typically, a rescue playbook is utilized uh, during this phase, as well as a customer startup guide to help the teams align and ramp up quickly to get the study back on track. But ultimately, it comes down to um, a few things, proactive risk management, 
transparent and frequent communications. Uh, these are really key to successfully rescuing a study. Yeah, that transparency, I think, is something that we can kind of hear throughout. Um, and, and maybe a good segue to, to Erica. So as far as being transparent and, and information sharing, it's at a critical point where you might be making a change from one technology provider to another. A certain level of um, documentation and communication needs to be shared. So from, from your perspective and what you've seen, what, what types of documentation are shared with the new technology provider to help them get started? Well, I think, I think Shadi really covered a a great deal of it, um, and and you know you want you want the new uh, vendor to have the protocol. Find out what the you know what is the status. What's the data management uh, look like? What is the plan for data management? What is the transition plan? Literally creating, like Shadi said, a playbook that outlines what are the steps. What are the uh, the dates that these things are going to happen? Um, how you know what patient data will be transitioned over to the new vendor? Uh, so it really is really getting down into the details and the specifics around the study, and what the current assessment is of the study or current status of the study, and getting that full picture, and then and then being able to uh, you know create the plan around that. So, and imagining again that this is a, a time of um, stress and it's a time of you know really wanting to make sure that things stay on track. Help help us from your, from your perspective. Put us in the mind of the sponsor of the CRO. What, what what things are top of mind as far as considerations at this point when it's decided that a technology provider needs to be switched? Like, what, what's the mindset at that moment? I think the number one mindset has to be around patient safety, and then the uh, trial data integrity and quality being number two. So those are the things that really need to be at the forefront of the reason why, you know, we go to the trouble of switching um, or rescuing a trial uh, is just, is I think most importantly, patient safety and trial and in data integrity. And you, you keyed in on it there. So, it's, and that's in a situation where the trial uh, has already started the technology is live, it's being used by the site. Well, uh, at that point, if it's already launched, um, what risks or how should a sponsor or CRO evaluate risks uh, for data that's already collected? And what about new patients that are then coming on the study who may have not even used the current technology? I think the most important thing to take into consideration are, are those data management aspects. Uh, how many patients have been seen and, and how much data has already been collected and, uh, and how will that transition into a new, you know, how that will translate into a new vendor. And, um, you know, you want to try to prevent the, the rescue itself, if at all possible. But when that's just not possible, the most important thing is to make sure that you hit uh, all of those data management aspects and making sure that the those data points and that data integrity stays intact. Really, really good point. And I think it leads us to another good thought as well as we talk about the various stakeholders that are impacted in a rescue. But Shadi, maybe, maybe for you, if you can kind of give us some insight from a technology provider perspective is the role of training from a patient insight perspective in the circumstance uh, where rescue is introduced. How do you help get them comfortable with the new system? Yeah, training is critical to a successful transition for both the sites and the patients. Uh, during the design phase, we want to ensure that the design is consistent with the previous solution uh, to reduce the burden on, on sites and patients. So we typically do that by matching this existing instrument design appearance where it's feasible. Um, to again, minimize the differences. Um, this is gonna reduce the training burden on the sites and also on the patients. So early in the process, the training team should be involved in planning training development and also site and patient uh, engagement activities. We recommend uh, deploying the training on the actual ECOA devices uh, by utilizing the on-device training, uh, we can ensure that users complete the training successfully prior to engaging with the study. So we highly recommend this gated approach to training to ensure that everyone is ready, um, trained um, before they start the study. So also for the sites that were already utilizing the previous solution, site-specific support should be um, provided to successfully transition them to the new device and the solution. I mean, this is critical 
to um, ensuring a positive experience for both the sites and the patients. It's a really good point. And I think that, so from a technology provider perspective, it's the creation of that training and it's making sure that, um, you know, folks are comfortable with it and it helps them utilize the new system. But maybe Erica, from, from your perspective, how's that communicated to the site? So how does the CRO or a sponsor even um, share that communication with the site of, of what's changing and why? And, and when is that communication shared? I think that uh, by the time that you get to the point for the rescue and that you've determined that a rescue is going to happen, the sites are not likely going to be terribly surprised. Uh, they're going to be expecting something because they've had hurdles and issues themselves that they've experienced. So, but typically the sponsor, the CRO will send out um, a, a notification to the sites indicating that the study is changing, you know, technical providers, uh, there's a, you know, a planned go live date with the new provider, uh, provide them with the links for the new training and, and, and you know, kickoff meetings, etc. cetera. Uh, and, you know, the two tech providers will also be conducting meetings and, and communicating their transitions as well to the sites. Perfect. So I think that, again, the theme of today has been uh, the oversharing almost of information is certainly important in these situations. Um, so, so with that, I wanted to say that I personally have learned uh, a lot about rescue studies and appreciate all the, the information that you all were able to, to share with us. I think that we obviously established the, the baseline of what a rescue is. We talked a little bit about how to avoid them uh, and some considerations to make if you find yourself in a situation where, you know, it just has to happen from a, a technology provider change. So some of the key things for me were around, you know, over communicating, uh, ensuring that both uh, the technical specifications as well as all considerations from what the vendor or technology provider can do at the beginning of the trial are understood. How uh, they can, you know, certainly support from a quality perspective, um, both at the software quality as well as from supporting um, regulatory submissions and the, the burden that is required for ensuring that the data is, you know, regulatory defensible. So really appreciate, again, the insight, the wisdom, and, and everything that you were able to share with us. Uh, and again, we're happy to take some, some questions from the audience. So we'll, we'll move to the Q&A section and, and look forward to hearing what questions you might have. <laughs> 